Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to be starting a brand new unit. And this unit is going to be dealing with probabilities. So it only makes sense for us to start out with an introduction of probabilities and making sure we understand some basic concepts, some basic terminology, uh, some terminology that we're going to be using throughout this unit. Um, so let's start out by looking at some of these basic terms that I have up above here. Uh, to start out with, let's just talk about what an experiment is. Common sense, it should just be, uh, or we know that an experiment is a situation with several possible results. Okay, that's what we call an experiment. Now, probabilities are what we call a measure of how relatively often each of the results occur. And each result of a, an experiment, we call those results outcomes. Now, the set of all possible outcomes is referred to our sample space. Now, we describe a sample space a certain way. We use these little brackets to describe a sample space. And just as a side note, anytime you see a circle with a line through it, inside of one of those brackets, we call that the empty set. When we're working with probabilities, an empty set would refer to something that's not possible. So in other words, flipping a coin and having it turn up as a three is not possible. There's no three on a, on a coin. It's either heads or tails. Um, or if I have a um, spinner that has six sections, numbered one through six, the probability of me spinning the spinner and having it land on a ten is impossible. It's not going to happen. Those are just some, some uh, basic um, ideas of a situation that would result in an empty set. So let's look at some other situations, though. Let's look at some examples where we can see probability being used. Um, so let's go ahead and look at this first one dealing with two six-sided die. Okay, so here it says two six-sided dice, one red and one green are thrown, and both numbers are recorded. Now it says list all possible outcomes for the experiment. Now I don't want to take the time to do that, so instead what I've done here for you is I've put a diagram that lists all the possible scenarios. So we could get a one and a one, so a one on the red and a one on the green. We could get a one red and a two on the green. We could get a one on the red and a three on the green, and so on. So again, this lists all the possible scenarios that we could get. So how many outcomes are in the sample space for this experiment? Well, we can count them all up, and we can see that basically what we have here is we have um, six rows of six columns. So six times six would be 36. There's a total of 36 possible outcomes would be our answer. Um, by the way, in the future, there's going to be questions in regards to a situation like this, rolling two dice. Um, and on a quiz or a test, um, I'm going to give you uh, this sample space, and that way you can have that to refer to. Let's look at another example. Here we have a small box that contains 30 blue, 30 green, and 25 red paper clips. Two paper clips are taken from the box, and their colors are recorded. Now we want to list all the possible outcomes for this experiment. So let's think about this for a second. We're going to be reaching in and grabbing two paper clips. It doesn't matter right now how many of each ones there are. All we know that, or all that matters for right now is that we have some blue, some green, and some red paper clips. So it would be possible for us to get two blue paper clips. It would be possible for us to get two green paper clips. And it would be possible to get two red paper clips. But there's other possibilities as well. I could get a blue and a green. I could get a blue and a red. I could get a green and a red. Now, a red and a green would be the same as a green and a red. A green and a blue would be the same as a blue and a green. And a red and a blue would be the same as a blue and a red combination. So we would have a total of six different outcomes would be our answer for part B. How many outcomes are in the sample space? There would be a total of six. Now, an event is any subset of the sample space of an experiment. So sticking with this previous example with dealing with the paper clips, um, a subset for that, so all the possible outcomes, all the sample space is listed, blue, blue, green, green, red, red, blue, green, blue, red, and green, red, are all the um, pieces in our sample space. So a subset of that, or an event of that, would be getting two paper clips of the same color, or getting at least one blue um, paper clip. Those could all be events for that sample space. Now the probability of an event 
is listed as this. It's the probability of an event is the number of times it's or the number of outcomes in the particular event that we're looking for over the number of outcomes in the sample space. So, for example, looking at one of those that I previously mentioned as far as the event of getting two paper clips of the same color. Well, that happens three times in that sample space. So the probability of that happening would be three out of, and there's a total of six outcomes in our sample space, so three out of six, or we reduce that to one half. Or if I said the probability of getting at least one blue paper clip. Well, here we have one blue paper clip, here we have one blue paper clip, and here we have one blue paper clip. So the probability of getting at least one blue paper clip would be three out of six or one half as well. Now, if I said the probability of getting just one blue paper clip, I would take away the blue and the blue, and I would focus on these two outcomes. So then I'd have two out of six or one out of three. So that is how we find the probability of an event. Now, when a sample space has n outcomes, all of which are equally likely, then the experiment is called a fair or unbiased experiment. So again, if, if, it's, if each of them, if each um, outcome is equally likely to occur, it's a fair uh, experiment or an unbiased experiment. So flipping a coin is an easy example. There's only one head and one tail, so the probability of getting heads and the probability of getting tails are going to be the same, so that would be a fair experiment. And each outcome has a probability of 1 over n, because there's two outcomes. Each outcome has a probability of 1 out of 2. Now, if I had a spinner that was divided up into six equal sections, then each one would have a 1 in 6 probability. And again, the outcomes are said to occur randomly, because it doesn't follow a particular pattern. They're complete, pattern, they're completely random. Now, let's look at this example. Here it says, an experiment consists of tossing two fair coins and counting the number of heads. Consider the events of getting one head in all, two heads in all, or getting no heads at all. Are these events equally likely? Now, one of the ways that we could figure out all the possible outcomes is by drawing what's called a tree diagram. So let's show how to do that. So in our first toss of the coin, we could get either heads or tails. Now in the second, because we're tossing two coins, in the second toss or in the second coin, we could also get heads and tails. Now we're going to branch that off though from these two that we had in the first toss. So from the first toss, I could get heads on the first toss, and on the second toss I could get heads or tails. Or I could get tails on the first toss, and in the second toss also get heads or tails. So now I can list out my outcomes. So I could get heads or heads, or I could get heads or tails. I could get tails and heads, and tails and tails. So technically, I have a total of four possible outcomes. And so now we want to figure out what's the probability of getting one head in all. So getting one head happens two times out of a total of possibility of four outcomes, which would happen 50% of the time, or one in two times. The probability of getting two heads in all happens just one out of the four times. Probability of getting zero heads, well, that's the same as getting both tails. That happens also one out of those four times. So the question asks, are these events equally likely? My answer would be no, because the probability of getting one heads is better than getting either two heads or no heads. Let's look at another example. Here it says, a researcher is studying the number of boys and girls in families with three children. Assume that the birth of a boy or girl is equally likely. We want to list the sample space. 
So one of the ways that we could do that is by creating, again, a tree diagram. I don't have a lot of space here um, underneath the question, so I'm going to do that over here on the right. So again, our first child, we could either have a boy or a girl. You want to give yourself plenty of space here because we're going to do this for three children. So the second child, should give myself a little bit more space. Our second child, we could either have a boy or a girl. Now we could have had a girl in the first child, but again with the second child, we could either have a boy or a girl. Oops. And now for the third child, for each of these, we would have a boy or a girl. So when you're doing these, you want to make sure that you give yourself plenty of space. Now the way that we would read this is each of these branches would give us an outcome. So we would have, we could have two, uh, all three boys. We could have a situation where we would have two boys and a girl and so on. So let's list out all these possible outcomes. So we could have a situation again involving all three boys. We could have our first two being a boy and our third child being a girl. We could have boy, girl, boy. We could have boy, girl, girl. And that is that first section of our tree diagram. Now we're going to go down to our second section where we would have had a girl first, followed by two boys. We could have a girl, then a boy, then a girl. We could have a girl, girl, then a boy. And then we could have a girl, girl, then a, another girl. So all three girls. So there's a total of eight possibilities here. There's eight total possible outcomes. Now it says find the probability that a family of three children has exactly one boy. So I want to look here and see how many times does it happen where we have exactly one boy. So here's one time where it happens. Here's another time where it happens where we have one boy and two girls. But those are the, oh, here's another one. I think those are the only ones here. So we have three situations out of eight where we could have um, exactly one boy. Now we could write this as a percent, so to get this as a percent, remember we first change this to a decimal, which as a decimal this is approximately 0.375, and then change it to a percent by multiplying by 100 or moving the decimal to the right three place, uh, two places. So we end up getting 37.5, or we can say approximately 38%. So you have approximately a 38% chance of having exactly one boy when you're having three children. So why don't you guys do this next one on your own. So it says here we're going to, we, if you did this on your own sheet, we can just branch off and, and have a fourth column here. So it says assume that the birth of boys and girls are equally likely. How many outcomes are in the sample space for families with four children? So what you're going to do is you're going to come up with a fourth spot here for the fourth child to figure out all the possible outcomes. So the goal here, you don't have to list them all out. They just want to know, though, how many outcomes are in the sample space. And then in Part B, you're going to find the probability that a family of four children has one girl and three boys. So why don't you guys go ahead and pause the video and hit play when you're ready to check to see if you have the correct answer. Okay, so let's check to see how you did here. You should have drawn out or added another column, like I said, to this uh, these branches that we already had of boys and girls. And if you count up, the easy way to do that would be to count up the last piece uh, in that tree diagram. So we'd have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So it would be 16 total branches, so 16 total possible outcomes here. When it says find the probability that a family of four children has one girl and three boys, that's what I've highlighted, these different paths. So here's one path that would result in one girl and three boys. And here's another one over here. So we'd have a total of four possibilities out of 16 possible outcomes, which reduces to one fourth. So we have a one in four chance. If we have four girls, we have or four children, 
we'd have a one in four chance of having one girl and three boys, which is 25%. Now, just to give you a little bit of background information here, some personal information, I actually have four children, and all four of my children are girls. So the probability of that happening would be 1 out of 16, or just a little over 6% chance. So that is some little information about myself. Some, we kind of broke the odds there, as far as probability speaking. Now here is some background, or here's some basic information for probabilities that you should be aware of. First off, all probability of any event is going to be greater than or equal to 0 or less than or equal to 1. You're never going to have the probability of, of an event being a negative number, and you're never, never going to have the probability of, an, of an event occurring that's going to be greater than 1. It will always be from 0 to 1. Now, if the event, that's what E is equal to here, is the event, and S is representing the sample space, if the number, or if the event is the same as the sample space, so if the same number of events happening as there are in the sample space, then the probability of that event is going to be 1, meaning it's going to happen no matter what. It's got a 100% chance of happening. If the event is impossible, then the probability of the event is 0. So those are three things to make sure you understand about events, or probabilities of events. And let's end by talking about what's called the relative frequency. The relative frequency is a ratio, it's a fraction. So it's the ratio of the number of times event occurs over the number of times it could occur. So the relative frequency, so let's talk about the relative frequency and probability. Because there are times where the relative frequency could be equal to zero. Now what that means is that it hasn't occurred yet. doesn't mean that it's not possible, it just means that it hasn't occurred yet. So just think of frequency as the number of times something occurs. Now the probability equaling zero means that it's not possible. Okay, so for example, the relative frequency, you could have a situation where um, you're flipping a coin three times, and you get heads all three times. So in that situation, we have heads all three times. Well, it's possible for, it would have been possible for us to have gotten tails all three times. So the number of times it could occur would be, it could occur all three times. Well, the number of times that it actually occurred was zero. So the relative frequency in this situation where I got heads all three times, the relative frequency of getting tails would be zero. That does not mean that it's not possible, it just means that it hasn't occurred yet. So that's different from having a probability of equaling zero. So probability equaling zero would mean that it's impossible. Where it is possible to get tails, it's just that in this particular situation, the number of times it occurred would be zero out of three. So there is a difference between a relative frequency being equal to zero and a probability equaling zero. Relative frequency is, again, referring to the number of times something occurs. Probability is the probability of it actually happening. So that's it. That is our introduction to probabilities. So hopefully you have a better understanding now of some of this terminology. And good luck now as you work on your assignment.